Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Please come closer, inshaAllah. Brothers, we're sitting. May Allah Ta'ala reward you for your sacrifice, mujahada, to sit for some time after such a long night of ibadah. Inshallah, we'll try to maybe be a bit uh, shorter than last, uh, yesterday. Uh, yesterday God, was a bit longer, perhaps. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محم تنزيله بعد نعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان صدق الله العظيم This ayah that I recite in front of you we have been hearing it many times throughout Ramadan one particular aspect of this ayah, I wanted to remind myself and everyone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He introduces the month of Ramadan, the first sifa and the first attribute, He mentions, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. We might have imagined Him to introduce the month by saying, الَّذِي افْتُرِضَ فِيهِ الصِّيَامِ This is the month in which fasting has been prescribed, or sunnah fihi al-qiyam, or the qiyam is a sunnah or the month of sabr, the month of muasat, the month of feeling the pain of others, the month of sadaqat. It is all of the above and more. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, it, uh, all of those things later or in the ahadith, whereas the first attribute he mentions is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. So this is definitely an opportunity for us to reevaluate our relationship with the Qur'an. And to see how far we are in fulfilling the rights of the Qur'an and where we are lacking. The Qur'an will testify on the Day of Judgment one of two ways. The Qur'an will testify either in your favor or against you. And obviously we want the Kalam of Allah to testify in our favor, not against us. Likewise, Rasulullah will either praise us and say that we have fulfilled the right of the Qur'an or he will complain against us. As is mentioned in Surah Al-Furqan, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قُمْ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا O my Lord, after me and my people, they abandon the Qur'an. So we do not want by any means the Qur'an to testify against us. We do not want, subhanAllah, may Allah protect us, that the Prophet ﷺ testifies against us. That would be utter disaster. So we have to ensure that we are fulfilling the rights of the Qur'an. And there's one particular aspect that I want to, to clarify because of the confusion from different quarters. Just like yesterday, we talked about one extreme and the other extreme and where we are in the middle, if you recall. Some were focused just on Kitabullah, some were focused on Rijalullah, so-called Rijalullah. The reality is that we have to combine both and gain hidayah from the combination of wahi and sahib al-wahi. The revelation and those upon whom the revelation was sent down and implemented it, practiced it, if you recall from yesterday. So likewise, over here, we are going to be talking about two extremes and we are going to be talking about the correct interpretation in the middle. So when it comes to the Qur'an, as far as the rights of the Qur'an are concerned, the first one is the tilawa, reciting the Qur'an. The second one, of course, is the faham, to understand it. Third is to make amal on it. And a fourth is to make tabliq of it. All of these are proven from the Qur'an. When it comes to the tilawa, reciting it, Allah Ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ أَتِيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَتْلُونَهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَةِ Those we have granted the book, they fulfill the right of its recitation. When it comes to the faham and understanding it, Allah Ta'ala tells us, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka, Allah has revealed this book upon you. Mubarakun, it is a blessed book. Liyadabbaru ayatihi, so you can ponder and reflect over its signs, over the ayat, over the verses. Waliyatadakkara ulul albab, and those who have intelligence may take a lesson. When it comes to amal, practicing, that's everywhere in the Quran is all about making amal. This Quran is inviting to the right path. When hadha sirati mustaqiman, this is a straight path. Fattabi'u, follow its way, follow the way of the Quran. Allah is speaking to us in the Qur'an, أَتِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَتِيعُ Rasul, Obey Allah and the Rasul. So the amal is obviously there. And then the tabliq of it, the da'wah, inviting others towards the Qur'an, that is mentioned in so many ayahs. قُلْ Say, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my way. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Invite towards Allah. عَلَى بَصِيرًا With conviction, with wisdom. 
It is my way and the way of all those who profess to follow me. So everyone must invite towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kuntum khayra ummah, you are the best of the nations. Ukhrijat linnas, Allah has selected you for the guidance of mankind. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof, you invite towards good. Wa tanhuna anil munkar, you forbid evil. Wa man ahsanu qawlan, whose words are better, min man da'a ila Allah, than the one who invites towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Udu'u ila sabili rabbik, invite to the path of your Lord, bil hikmah, with wisdom, wal mu'ithat al hasana, in good counsel. Etc, etc. So many ayat talk about da'wah, inviting. So, we wanted to focus today on the first two rights. The tilawat and faham and the relationship between the two. One is to recite the Qur'an, the tilawah, and the second is faham to understand. As I said, when it comes to these things, these two, we find two extremes. Ifrad and tafrit. One excess one way, one the other way. And the correct is in the middle. What I was referring to by saying, by making these two groups is that when it comes to uh, tilawa reciting and faham understanding, one group is holding on firmly to tilawa and they absolutely have no concern about faham. And the other group is uh, obsessed about so-called faham and they disregard and look down and consider it futile to make tilawa, to recite the words. So that's just a service level description of the two groups. A little bit deeper what these groups are saying. One, those who are holding on to the tilawa and have no concern about the faham whatsoever. First of all, we're talking about those who have not learned the Arabic language to begin with because there would be uh, spontaneously some level of faham when you read it if you know the Arabic language. How much faham? Very limited faham, but some level of faham. Faham meaning understanding. You would be understand something. So those who un- unfortunately were not growing, they did not, um, they were not born uh, in a culture in, uh, where the, their native language is Arabic. Um, when Islam spread, uh, the language of Arabic spread with it. So, uh, so when it spread north out of the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabic language moved north. Then when it went west into Egypt, Arabic went there. Then it went into Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. The Arabic language continued to spread. When it went into Spain, Spain was speaking Arabic. But when it went east, then Iran came. Iran was a very, very cultured region. They had their own um, civilization. And it was very much entrenched in their society, their customs, their rituals, their practices. So that was the Farsi language. And they adopted Islam too. But they kept their Farsi language. And as Islam continued to move east from Persia, then the Muslim language of Persian, Farsi, continued going east, rather than Arabic. So the countries east of there, they inherited Farsi. Um, And that was the official language of the Muslim governments. So the people... Uh, in Delhi, for example, the, per, Farsi was not the indigenous language. They, they were not speaking Farsi. In the Mughal Empire, that was not their local language. But when the Muslims came in, they brought the Farsi language. So that is something that happened in history. In any case, there are people who are non-native Arabic speakers. They do not understand the Arabic language. And they are very much focused on reciting the words. They feel that this is the way of gaining tabarruk and baraka. Uh, they come with different rituals when a person dies. On the third day, you have to make a khatam, the tijwa, or after 40 days, the jalam, or annually, the barsi. So they take it out and they will, they will read it. They may even make a khatam of the whole recitation, but never uh, are they focused on understanding what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to say. And not only they are negligent about it, but actually they actively are opposed to it. And they will say that, you know, you should not go into that, do not worry about that, that is beyond your pay grade, that is for the clergy class, that is for the scholars, and if you start trying to uh, read the translation, you may go astray. It's something that they're afraid of, they're they're frightened to read the translation, you know, just read the Arabic and move on, don't worry about the meaning whatsoever. So this is, obviously very wrong approach. 
And then uh, on the opposite spectrum, we have those who feel that the objective of the Qur'an are, is just the meanings, what Allah Ta'ala is trying to convey, the message. So we should focus only on the meanings, exclusively on the meanings, and try to um, understand it on our best, um, to the best of our ability. Sometimes not even in reading the tafsir of the scholars, but coming up with their own interpretations. That this is what I understand, what do you think this means? Just like in literature class, there may be um, uh, some po poetry that the teacher presents and says that, okay, what do you think this means? So uh, this is my interpretation of what the poet is trying to express. What is your interpretation? Everybody comes up with their own idea. It's not only limited to poetry, even uh, prose. There, Shakespeare said this um, in whatever, in Hamlet, Macbeth, whatever he used to study. This is, what, what do you think he's trying to convey by th this particular sentence? You know, what, what is, what's going on? What, is he, what, what are the meanings perhaps that, are, um, that Shakespeare is trying to convey? And it's not limited to literature, this type of interpretation is in all of the arts. If there's a painting, what was the objective uh, and the maqsad of the painter? Leonardo da Vinci painted this Mona Lisa. What is she? Is she happy? Is she sad? What, tr people are looking and staring at her face for centuries trying to figure out what, uh, what emotional state she is in. Then that's when you actually have a person to look at. Then if it's modern art, Picasso, it's just a bunch of paint on the wall and it's called art, then you know, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy all the different ideas that what is Picasso trying to say here. And this even extends to drama, to film, to movies. What was the director's objective? The different scenes that we are seeing, Naudhu Billah, uh, are they actual or are they in the mind of the protagonist, the antagonist, the character? Some of these scenes are real or they're fake? I mean, fake in this, the whole thing is fake, but what we mean by that is that, uh, is it uh, just in the mind? Is it a dream or is it actually happening in his life? Right. All of these interpretations people come up with, critics and, under, and people who are focused on all of these different arts. So, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, thumma na'udhu billah, a million times to the power of infinity, na'udhu billah, they uh, su subject the Qur'an to the same thing. So people are sitting around, first of all, again, they do not even understand the Arabic language. Uh, they read the translation and then they say, okay, now let's take turns. This is what I think Allah says. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Alhamdulillah, one a good thing is that this has become less and less common uh, because there are so many scholars of all different madhahib and all different masharib and masalik from different places in the world that are here now in America and in the Western countries as well. So to a great extent, this has been reduced. But I recall growing up in the 80s, this was very, very common. In the 80s, um, in many masajid, they would have Quranic study circles where people would take out the translation. Back in those days, it was Yusuf Ali and Piktal. These were the two famous ones. And, uh, and this was a very, very typical exercise. People open and read the translation and say, okay, this is what I think, what do you think, what do you think? What did Rasulullah say about this? Man qala fil Qur'ani bi ra'ihi Whoever speaks about the Qur'an by giving his own opinion, what he thinks it means, without knowledge, فَقَدْ أَخْطَأَ وَإِنْ أَصَابْ He has committed a major sin even if he ends up saying the truth. Coincidentally. Just by chance he ends up saying the right thing. It doesn't make a difference. He has still committed a sin. And وَمَنْ قَالَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ And whoever speaks about the Qur'an without knowledge فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Let him prepare his abode in the fire of Jahannam. Which is a much more severe warning. So these warnings are there. It is true that um, we cannot speak about the Qur'an and come up with the meanings on our own. But they are so-called focused just on the meaning. And what is even more hurtful and more incorrect and needs to be pointed out and refuted is the fact that they downplay reciting the words. They downplay it so much, they actually look uh, they, like a derision with hatred, um, it's, it's an inexplainable hatred at times about those who are reciting the Qur'an, those who make tilawat of the Qur'an, and my dear say, those who spend so much time memorizing it, they have some crazy passionate hatred against them. That this is a wasteful exercise. The kids are wasting their time, the parents are wasting their lives, their years, the teachers are wasting their time, 
the whole institution of his is such a waste of time. The term that is used is parrot-like. So just like a parrot is reading, has no faham, no understanding what's going on, these kids are all like parrots. Their teacher himself is like a parrot. They're all a big parrot and small parrots, they're all parrots. They're all wasting their time. And then so much anger comes out as if the primary reason of the downfall of the Ummah and any calamity happening anywhere is because of these kids who are doing hymns of the Qur'an. It's all their fault. This is the beginning of the downfall, the end of the downfall, the ultimate cause and the factor that is leading to the downfall of the Ummah are these people who are doing hymns, right? So this is the, the type of hatred. You may think like, why am I going so extreme on this? It's because we have, we have read such words, we have heard such words, we have come across such people. Uh, I'm speaking from experience. All right. So, so they, 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 they always say, look, why are you so worried about the words? Right? Just focus on the meanings. And uh, the meanings that they're coming up with themselves are also majority of the time incorrect and without learning the proper tafsir. In fact, if they were learning the proper tafsir, then they wouldn't have fallen into this major error in their approach to the Qur'an too begin with. They would, have understand that, they would have understood that tilawat is also very, very important. And so now we understand the two extremes. Those that are focused just on the words, they recite it for barakah and blessing. Um, very ritualistic feel, and they are prone to many different types of bid'at and innovations. From a socio-economic perspective, most of these people happen to be the demographic that are poor, considered backward. And the other extreme we talked about are those so-called academic pseudo-intellectuals. Right? By and large, this is not a 100%, you know, we cannot generalize this, but by and large, those that are so-called academics, intellectuals, um, they ha have been exposed to secular education, you know, from the Western, um, perspective, narrative, that's their worldview, they come to this conclusion. Why are you stuck on the words? And others who are coming from, um, uh, subhanAllah, very traditional backgrounds, but unfortunately they, are, uh, they have not had the exposure to the correct ilm and ulama, they may reach this wrong conclusion to just focus on the words, hey, leave the meetings, that's for bigger folks, don't go there. If you go there, you may get lost, you may go astray, you may reach a wrong conclusion, you may get in trouble. The scholars, they know what they're talking about. That's not for us. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says that وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِذِكَرْ Allah ta'ala doesn't say it once. He says it multiple times in Surah Al-Qamar. Surah Al-Qamar is followed by Surah Al-Rahman. In Surah Al-Rahman, everybody knows about the fact that it's repeated many times. فَبِأَيَّ أَلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانَ That, oh, ins and jinn, how many blessings of your Lord will you deny? Uh, but it's less uh, known uh, that in the surah that immediately precedes it, there is also an ayah that is repeated multiple, multiple times. So many times it's repeated. What is, what is that ayah? وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِذِّكْرِي Allah Ta'ala doesn't say it once, He says it multiple times. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ Indeed, we have made the Qur'an easy. Indeed, we have made the Qur'an easy. Allah is saying so. So how can we say that, no, 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 the meaning is too hard, it's not for us. However, we also have to note that when Allah Sa'ala says the Qur'an is easy, He qualifies it, He doesn't say every single thing of the Qur'an is easy. He says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ When it comes to taking advice from the Qur'an, take, taking um, uh, spiritual benefit from the Qur'an, Allah has made it easy. فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Then He asks a question, is there anyone who wants to take admonition, advice from the Qur'an? Pose the question. So by adding the lidhikr, Allah Ta'ala is saying that with respect to taking admonition and taking advice, Allah has made it easy. He doesn't say, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ الْإِسْتِنْبَاثِ That I have made the Qur'an easy for deriving principles of fiqh and deriving the rulings from those principles. He doesn't say that. Because coming up with fiqh injunctions, coming up with understanding the ahkam, the principles, usul of tafsir and usul of fiqh, that is something that requires a lifetime of study. In fact, Allah Ta'ala, when He speaks about deriving rulings from the Qur'an, He says that, that they are, um, if you have a question, go back to Allah and the Rasul, go back to the Ulil Amr, go back to the scholars, 
Then لَعَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْ هُمْ He uses مِنْ تَبْعِيدِيَ which means some of the scholars who are, have been blessed with exceptional insight, they will be able to derive the rulings from the Qur'an. Go to them. Why do you have to go to them if everyone can figure it out? Remember, وَلَقَدْ يَسْرَنَا Quran. Quran is easy. Yes, it is easy for one thing. For what? لِذِّكْر To take admonition, take advice. It's not easy for everything. It's not easy for uh, everyone can come up with their own fatwa. No. Because even the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all the Sahaba were in give fatwa. They were 12 to 14, 12 or 14 different Sahaba whose names are mentioned, that they were Arbab al-Fatwa, they would give fatwa. And um, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had given them ijazah for their respective areas when they were away. Otherwise, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself is present, they would go and ask him. Like Mu'ad bin Jabal, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A'lamuhum bil halali wal haram. Mu'ad ibn Jabal the, my, from my companions the one who has the most knowledge of halal and haram is Mu'ad ibn Jabal when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him to Yemen he, he asked him in the very famous hadith he was um, walking out with him to see him off up to the saniyatul wada' the place of uh, saying goodbye and farewell and he asked him O oh, Mu'ad when you go then I will make ishtihad I will look at the Quran I will look at the sunnah I will uh, find some base, uh, principles foundational principles and based on that I will derive the ruling this is not child's play. It's not easy. So then uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam confirmed that. And he said, Alhamdulillah alladhi wafaqa rasoola rasoolillah. All praise and thanks to that Allah who has granted the tawfiq and guidance to the rasoola rasoolillah, to the messenger of the messenger of Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. And Mu'adh ibn Jabal is the messenger of the messenger of Allah. Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sending him to Yemen. He guided him to that which pleases him and which he is happy with. So he confirmed his response that it is the correct thing. So this is something that is not easy. So if you have the other extreme, they take everything in their hand, they come up with their own interpretations, come up with their own rulings, come up with some very, very strange rulings. Some of them I talked about yesterday. Um, and um, such explanations لم نسمع به نحن ولا آباؤنا من قبل neither we nor our forefathers ever heard of such a thing right so, so they will uh, very easily contradict the consensus in ijma of the uh, of the scholars and the ummah of 1400 years there is a consensus and the uh, understanding of a particular masala they'll come up with some crazy interpretations because they'll just say that نحن رجال هم الرجال they were men we are men Allah Ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَذَبَّرُونَ Quran." Do you not ponder and reflect over the Qur'an? أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Or are your hearts and minds locked up? So they'll say, my heart and mind is opened up. So Allah gave me a brain to think. So I'm thinking. So I think whatever I want. Unbridled, no, no particular framework, no principles. Just go wherever you want to and come up with whatever conclusion you desire. So this, this is what's happening. This is your so-called progressive movement. Alright, so... Reform movement like Christianity was there with all this wrong dogma to begin with the default was messed up But then after that you had the Protestant Reformation Martin Luther in Europe and everything and then how they completely changed the deen even more And then you have the Yehudi faith The Jewish faith There's the Orthodox and they kind of they made it more liberal and then they called it the conservative branch then they made it even Way liberal and that is uh, the reform branch of Judaism. Reform branch is so quote-unquote reformed that there's literally nothing left of the original Talmud, Torah, law. This is uh, so crazy that I personally, I remember in the interfaith, I talked to a rabbi who was a, an, a female rabbi because there are no female rabbis in Orthodox, but there was a, a female rabbi. That's why Maryam alayhi salam, what did, uh, Hanna bint Fahuda, the mother of Maryam alayhi salam, when she delivered the, uh, the baby, she had made the niyyah that her baby will be uh, uh, an imam, or quote unquote, you can even say a rabbi at that time, an alim, an imam. Oh Allah, the, the baby in my womb, I dedicate this as an imam and a rabbi of the Muslim, of the Muslim at that time, a Muslim Aqsa. فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي Allah accepted فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا But when she delivered the baby قَالَتْ إِنِّي وَضَعَتْهَا أُنْثَى She said, oh it's a girl The girl can't be the imam Allah Ta'ala knew that this baby is not a normal baby 
Then Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْسَى This is a very strange way Allah says. See, she was crying that it's a girl and she wanted a boy. Not because she didn't like girls, but because she had made a vow to Allah that the child will... If, she's, if she had made a vow that the child will be dedicated for khidmah of deen or will be salih and righteous, that's fine. It could be a girl or a boy. إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ مُؤْمِنِينَ مُؤْمِنَاتِ قَانِتِينَ قَانِتَاتِ We covered that, right? Ten sifat. So that's fine. They're equal. But she had made a specific niyyah that he will be the, uh, she, the child will be a imam. And now what happened is it's a girl. So she should have said, oh, this girl is not like a boy. She should have said, وَلَيْسَ الْأُنْثَى كَالذَّكَرْ this girl is not like the boy. But Allah Ta'ala didn't say that. He said it the other way around. وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى No, no, no. The boy that you wanted is nowhere near than the girl that you got. Because the boy you wanted was just going to be an imam, which is, inshallah, a great thing to be. But this is not just any girl. This is... Uh, إِنَّ اللَّهُ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ Has made you the, the best woman of all time. Wastafaki has chosen you ala nisa'il alameen over the women of all times. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Khairu nisa'il alameen arba'un. There are four women that are the best women of all time. Two in the previous ummah, two in this ummah. Maryam and Asya from the previous ummahs, Ali has ummah salam. And two from this ummah are Khadija and Fatima radiallahu anhumah. In this hadith, these four are mentioned. Aisha radiallahu anhumah, there are other virtues. In the fadl Aisha ala nisa'ak, a fadl al-tharid ala sa'il ta'am. Virtue of Aisha over other women is like the virtue of the Tharid over all the other foods and the other virtues of Aisha Siddiqah. So, four women are identified. Maryam and four women they represent, personify four traits. Maryam alayhi salam for chastity and Asya alayhi salam for sabr and patience. When people come and complain about, oh, my husband's like this, well, it can't be worse than Firaun. I'm not saying you should patiently endure all the trouble, but depending on the situation, there is khula, there is fast, there are times we need to leave the abusive relationship. But if it's not meant to leave, then we can take comfort from Asiya. She made so much sabr with Firaun. And then in this Ummah, Khadija radiallahu anha is khidmah of her husband with her wealth and her life, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And with Fatima, it's zuhud and her wara' and her taqwa and her abstinence. So these four sifat are personified by the four women. So, we were talking about Maryam alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're talking about imams were men in this deen as well as in the previous sharia. So this female rabbi, rabbi asked her that is there, um, is it true that there's kosher pork, like swine? He said, yeah, absolutely. If you bless it, then pork can be kosher. Right? So it's not just like making a riba, usually haram, and running the banks of the world, um, and, and then um, making the kosher, uh, making the swine, pig, as kosher and everything. So that's the reform movement in Judaism. And it has really nothing to do with the Jewish faith. And uh, now we have the so-called progressive movement within Islam too. So they're coming up with all kinds of different interpretations. And they, they, they are straying away from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we have introduced these two groups, now what we talked about, those are focusing on al-fal and those are focusing on ma'ani, words and meanings. When it comes to the definition of Qur'an, ismul al-Qur'an yutlaqa ala al-mabani wal-ma'ani. The word Qur'an is referring to the words. When you say Qur'an, it refers to words and meanings, both. And when you come to the definition of Qur'an, it is different from all other speech in many in many ways. Of course, it's first of all it's the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other speeches aren't. It's azali, abadi. It's, it's, as long as Allah was there, which is from pre-eternal times, the Quran and the sifat of Allah was there. Imam Ahmad and Muhammad Rahmatullah underwent so many sacrifices to establish this point in the era of the Mu'tazila when they were the kings. One difference of the Qur'an versus our normal speech that is relevant to the discussion on hand is the fact that in normal human speech there is a meaning and a ma'na in the mind of the speaker or in the mind of the author who's writing and he wants to convey that meaning in the of the ma'ani from his mind to the mind of the one who is listening 
to the spoken word or reading the written word. He wants to convey that meaning. That's basic communication. So there's mana from my mind going to your mind via verbal speech or mana from the author to the reader via written speech. So that's what communication is. Now how do I communicate the mana from my mind to your mind? The medium of that communication is words, ma'ani. We cannot just um, send it by Bluetooth, brain to brain, not yet. Allah alam what the future holds, right? But um, we cannot send it wirelessly. The way we send it is primarily through al but through ishara as well, through sign language. But we're not talking about sign language, we're talking about words, right? So the words are used. So the words are basically just a wasila, a means to communicate the ma'ani. That's it. The ma'ani, the meanings are the actual maqsood, the objective, and the words are just a vehicle, a means, a vehicle. They're not the objective. Because of this, in normal speech we will find that you read a text, you understand the meaning, that's it. You remember it, you put it away. If you forget, perhaps you need to go back and review it, you read it again. Um, but you will not take it out and read it every Friday. Or, you know, there's, there, there's no reason to keep on reading it. So if there is a, te- if there's a text uh, book you're studying for an exam, you forget, then you read it a couple times. But once you understand it, then you put it away. When it comes to the Qur'an, since both are maqsood, both are objectives, that's why we find that Rasulullah wasallam, when the Qur'an was revealed, he got the words and he got the meanings both at the same time. Then, there, what, what is the reason he is repeating the words? He is making tilawah of the words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qiyamah that, to console Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because initially when the revelation was coming, Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was stressing out to ensure that he memorizes what is being revealed. So he would quick, very rapidly be repeating what Jibril alaihi wasallam is saying, in case I miss something, in case I forget something. So Allah subhanahu wa taala told him to relax, just sit down and let the revelation come. Allah taala said, "La tuharrik bihi lisanak," don't continue to move your 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 tongue. You're very quickly repeating it, rapidly repeating what's being revealed. Don't do that. Inna alina jama'ahu. It is my responsibility. I will preserve this Quran in your heart. Quranahu. I will make it easy for you to recite it. Thumma inna alina bayanahu. And after that, I will inspire you with the meanings of the Quran as well. So Rasulullah got the words and got the meanings. Now, if he has to. If the meanings were the objective, he could have just explained the meanings to the ummah. And if he has to repeat the meanings to remind them, that makes sense. But why is he sitting by himself and reading the words? He's reading the Surah Kahf on Fridays. He's not just going over the meanings in his mind, he's reading the words. He's reading the words uh, of Surah Yasin, Surah Mulk, Surah Alif Lam, Sajda, Surah Waqia. And it's not just specific surahs have specific virtues. He had his own hizb and allotted portion of tilaw of the Qur'an that he would do daily. One waft, one delegation came and they're waiting by the Ustawan al-Wafud where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi would meet the delegations, the pillar. And uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out from his hujra delayed with some delay after some time. And he apologized and he said, I was completing my hizb, my daily appointed portion of reciting the Qur'an. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ramadan of his life, last uh, Ramadan of his life, he recited the Qur'an, all the words, to uh, Jibreel alayhi salam. And he listened to the whole Qur'an from Jibreel alayhi salam. And he recited the whole Qur'an to Zayd ibn Thabit. And he listened to the whole Qur'an from Zayd ibn Thabit. So what happened? From his teacher, he heard it and recited to. And from his student, Zayd ibn Thabit, he recited to and listened to. And Zayd ibn Thabit was selected because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made him, was going to prepare him for what? to be the chairman of the committee for the compilation of the Qur'an in the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and thereafter again in the Khilafah of Uthman. So he was being prep- pre- prepared for that task. Because he knew, uh, he had the Ardhat al-Akhira, the final compl- uh, complete recitation, he was 
not just a, there, he was a participant in that final review. So he knew which ayat were mansukh or abrogated and which ayat are muhkam remain. So we have to understand this is unique. This is unique because the alfaz are maqsood just like the ma'ani. The words are an objective just like the ma'ani. There are so many ways we can see this. One way we just talked about the fact that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reciting the words over and over again. That tells us that it is a maqsood. Another way is for us to see that is the word itself, tilawa. Tilawa is such a unique verb in the Arabic language which is only used for the ritual recitation of the Quranic words, not for anything else. So we cannot make the tilawa of a newspaper or a magazine. We will make qira'ah. Qira'ah means to read. But talayatul tilawa is only to make tilawa read the Quran. So we cannot make tilawa of uh, any text, any email. We cannot make tilawa even of a hadith of Rasulullah There's no tilawa of Bukhari and Muslim. There's dars of it, there's tadris of it, there's qira'ah of it, there's reading it, there's studying it, but there's no tilawa of it. Even though the hadith of Rasulullah are a form of wahi, revelation. Because وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He does not speak from his desires. In هُوَا إِلَّا وَحِي نِيُّهَا It is also wahi. But tilawa is not done. In fact, the, the distinction between hadith and Qur'an, the word that is used by the ulama is wahi matlu and wahi ghair matlu. The wahi you do tilawa of is called Qur'an. And the wahi you do not make tilawa of is called hadith. Because who, who recited the Qur'an? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And who spoke the hadith? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who, which, which one came from Allah? Both. So what's the difference? The difference, the distinctive factor is, the, the, the distinction is based on the fact that which one is, you make tilawa of is called Qur'an. It's literally called wahyun matlu'un and wahyu ghayr matlu. The wahi of you make tilawa of, like ritually recited. The wahi you make, you recite in the salah, in the khatam, in the taraweeh, that's called Qur'an. In the wahi, you don't recite in the talawi, in the salah, that's called hadith. So that's how important tilawa is. Talayatul tilawa. It only means to recite the Quran, nothing else. And when we want to understand how the words are so uh, an objective, another way to see this and examine this is that if somebody says, okay, just is the meanings are what counts, right? So if you take the Qur'an, you translate it in any language. Can that be called the Qur'an? No. If you translate it in English, Farsi, Urdu, anything, that will be an interpretation of the Qur'an. It's never the Qur'an. Somebody says, okay, that's a different language altogether. How about in the Arabic language? I take the meanings of the Qur'an, I make an easier version. Like we go back to Shakespeare and everything, then there's the cliff notes, the abridged version, easier version. So you have an easier, easier version, that will be called a tasheel of the Qur'an or a tafsir of the Qur'an. Tabiru murad illahi ta'ala bi kalami. Explaining what Allah is trying to say. It's not called Qur'an. If somebody says, okay, there's non-Qur'anic words there. How about I make iltizam, I bind myself that I will only use Qur'anic vocabulary to convey the Qur'anic words. But I will rearrange it to make the sentences simpler and easier. By using only Qur'anic vocabulary, still that's not going to be a Qur'an. It has to be the exact words in the exact same order. So what does that tell you again? The meaning is maqsood for sure, but the words are also an object. And if we look at the maqasid of nabuah, the purposes of prophethood, there are not 40 or 400, they have been narrowed down to four foundational maqasid of nabuah, purposes of prophethood. And these purposes of prophethood are mentioned three different places in the Quran. First, it comes when Ibrahim is making dua. He mentions the four purposes of prophethood. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, and then Allah ta'ala mentions that he accepted the dua of Ibrahim. In Tafsir Qurtubi, under the Tafsir of this, there's a hadith where somebody came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa and said that, حَدِّثْنَا عَنْ بَدِي أَمْرِكِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Tell us something about earlier phase of your life. So some, many times when they're interviewing different famous personalities, then their lives become more documented and well-known after they become famous, whether in politics or entertainment or sports or whatever. So sometimes the interviewer in, for the magazine or whatever, he will say that, tell us something about your childhood, something interesting, like that we don't know. So we can, because we're your fan, we're interested in your life, tell us something when you were a kid growing up. 
So that's how he asked. After Nabuwa, after prophethood, the Sahaba, diehard fans, were all around him. They were counting how many gray hairs he has and how he makes wudu and how he sleeps and how he eats and how he walks. Everything is recorded. So he asked, Hadithna an badi amrik. Tell us something about your earlier part of your life. He thought he was going to say something about his childhood. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went way, way, way back before his childhood, before he was born, centuries before. And he said that Ana ijabatu da'wati Abi Ibrahim. I'm actually the personification in flesh of the dua of the acceptance of the acceptance of the dua of my forefather Ibrahim. Wa ana ta'biru ru'ya wa ana bushra Isa. I am the glad tiding and the bashara that Isa alayhi salam had given. Wa ana mubashirun bi rasuli yati min ba'di ismuhu Ahmad. I come to give the glad tiding when Nabi will come after me. His, nabi, his name is Ahmad, Surah Al Saf. And I am the ta'bir ruya ummi. I am the interpretation of the dream my mother had when she was pregnant, when she saw the nur emanating from her womb, uh, from her womb and uh, it was um, reflected on the qusur of Sham, on the palaces of Syria. I am the interpretation of that dream. You went that far back. The part that we are talking about here, the mustadal is ana ijabatu da'wati abi Ibrahim. I am the personification of the acceptance of the dua of my forefather Ibrahim. So what was the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam? He made a dua that Rabbana wabath fihim, O Allah, send in my progeny a teacher, a Nabi. And what should this Nabi do? Four things. Yatlu alayhim ayatika. We covered the word tilawa. He will make tilawa of your ayat. And then, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He will teach them the ma'ani, the meanings of the Qur'an. And will teach them wisdom, number three. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And he will purify them. He will make the tazkiyah. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ You are the Almighty, the All-Wise. These are the four things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He accepted His dua, He repeats the same four. He says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Indeed, Allah has done a great favor upon the believers. إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ When He sent amongst them, رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنْفُسِيهِمْ A messenger from amongst them. رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَثْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He does tilawa of the ayat. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them the meaning of the book and teaches them hikmah. وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُوا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ And prior to his advent, they were in open error and astray. So, from these four, two of them have to do with the Qur'an. Yani, if you're um, summarizing all the different responsibilities of prophethood, and you're making it, bringing it down to only four things, you could have just sufficed with one about the Qur'an and carry on with other tasks and missions and objectives of prophethood. But two of the four deal with Qur'an. One is with respect to the words, and the second one is with respect to the meaning. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ does tilawa of the ayat. So what do you make tilawa of? The words or the meanings? Words. وَيَعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابِ And he teaches them. So there's ta'aleem of the kitab, it teaches them the meanings, and tilawa of the ayat is besides the words. And these tasks of prophethood were continued on. Who continued the task of the tilawa? The qurra. The great qurra. Who preserved the words of the Qur'an. And ma'ani, the meanings, the mufassiru and the scholars of tafsir. So you have, for example, Imam Nafir Madani, Imam Ibn Kathir Makki, Imam Abu Amr Basri, Ibn Amr Shami, Imam Hamza Kufi, Imam Kisai Kufi, Imam Asim Kufi. These are the seven Imams of Qiraat. And then we have Imams of Tafsir and Imams of Fiqh. They focused on the meanings. Both of them were preserved. Both are objectives. Tilawat of Ayat and Ta'aleem of the Kitab. So we cannot go on any extreme. One objection of those who are against the words and just focus on the meanings is that what's the point? What's the reward? Are you going to get any reward? What's the, how are you going to get reward if you don't even know what you're reading? How are you going to get any reward if you don't know what you are reading? Yes, we should work on learning the meaning as well. Undoubtedly. That's what we're talking about, combining the two. But when the objection comes that what is the reward for reading without knowing the meaning, you'll say there definitely is a reward. What's your evidence? The one hadith in which the reward for reciting has been mentioned. In that hadith, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants to give an example of how much reward you're going to receive for reading, he gives the example of that word, the meaning of which is unknown. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qara harfam min kitab illa, whoever recites a letter from the book of Allah, falahu bi hasana, will receive a good deed. Wal hasanatu bi ashri amthaliha, every good deed will be multiplied ten times. Now, if he wanted to give an example, he could have said like, Alhamdu, Alif ten rewards, Lam ten rewards, Ha ten rewards, Mim ten rewards, Dal ten rewards, for Alhamdu fifty rewards. First ayah of Surah Fatiha. Or the other call of first ayah of Surah Fatiha is Bismillah. Whether it's part of the Sabal Muthani or not, there's a few opinions, different opinions. Surah Fatiha has seven ayat. Is Bismillah the first ayah or Alhamdulillah is the first ayah? There's two opinions. So that's why you have different ayat markings. Surat al ladina Anamta Alayhim. Right there, Alayhim. Is that ayah number six or is that's not ayah number six? It continues. If you count Bismillah as ayah number one, then it's Surat al-Ladina anta alayhim wa yar madubi alayhim wa al The whole thing is ayah number seven. It has to be seven. Because Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ آتِنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ I have granted you seven ayat that are repeated. So anyway, he could have said Bismillah. So ba ten rewards, seen ten rewards, meem ten, uh, ten rewards. Bismi is thirty rewards. So the, I mean, there are many different words he could have chosen to give as an example that for every letter you receive 10 rewards but to settle the debate for once and for all and squash the objections of those who claim that there is no reward for reciting the Quran without meaning knowing the meaning he gave an example to illustrate the reward of each letter being 10 times of those letters the meanings of which are Unknown. By saying, لا أقول أليف لا ميم حرف بل أليف حرف ولا من حرف وميم حرف. He said, for Alif, La, Meem. For Alif, you receive 10 rewards. Lam, you receive 10 rewards. Meem, you receive 10 rewards. But you, they say, hey, you don't, know the, you don't know the meaning, you don't get thawab. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alif, La, Meem, you receive 30 rewards. What's the meaning? You don't know the meaning either. Because Allah Allah alone knows the meaning. Alif, Lam, Mim, and Hamim, Ain, Sin, Qaf, and Taha, and Tasin, and Alif, Lam, Ra, and Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Sa'ad. All of these letters, these are Al Huruf Al Mukhatta'ad, the letters that are in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala says, Who are the Ali Al Kitab? He revealed the Quran upon you. Minhu Ayatun Muhkamat. Certain ayat or meaning are well known, established. Hunna Umm Al Kitab, that's the actual book you need to focus on. Wa Ukharum Mutashabihat. There are other ayat which are confusing in nature. فَمَا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ Those whose hearts are crooked فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ They fall, go into the mutashabi ayat اِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ To seek fitna and cause fitna in the ummah وَبْتِغَاءَ تَعْوِيلِ And come up with their false interpretations وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Nobody knows the meaning of those ayat except for Allah وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Those who have depth of knowledge يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ They say we believe in all of it. كُلُّ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا يَذَكَّرُوا إِلَّا أُولُّ الْأَلْبَابِ Only those who have intelligence, they will take heed. So this mutashabi ayat, some of them are such that مَعْلُومُ الْمَعْنَى and غَيْرْ مَعْلُومُ murad. We know the translation, we don't know the meaning, what it actually intends. And beyond that are some that غَيْرْ مَعْلُومُ الْمَعْنَى murad. Even the translation and the meaning, both are unknown. Like if Allah Ta'ala says, يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ The hand of Allah is over their hands. We know the translation. But what is meant by the hand of Allah, we are not sure. We know for a fact that it doesn't refer to a physical limb. We are not a mujassima and give tajseem and jism to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, we make tanzeeh of Allah. Laysa kamithrihi shay. None of the creation is like unto him. He does not resemble his creation in the least. And we make tafweed of the ma'ana to Allah. Allah a'lamu bi muradi. He knows better what he, what he means. This is the way of the salaf. The way of the khalaf, the later day scholars, they made a ta'wil, sarful kalam an al They say that, okay, this. Because of a qarina, because the context, they say that this means perhaps the help of Allah. This means the strength of Allah, the might of Allah. The hand of Allah is referring to the might of Allah, the strength of Allah. They come up with these interpretations, possible interpretations. So this is an ayah mutashabih. And what is even more than, see the translation is known, the actual intent is not known. And then you have these alif, la, meem, the translation and the intent, both are unknown. If it's, if it's ghair ma'lum, ma'na wal murad, it doesn't mean ghair fa'idah, mufid. Something the meaning is unknown, yes. Translation is unknown, yes. There's no benefit, no, there is benefit. There's so many different benefits. One of them is that this is a test. It's a test for the believers. And those who uh, are very inquisitive by nature, want to know the depth of everything, they're very curious. It's a test for them to stop. 
and say that, okay, for this we will leave it to Allah. One opinion is that it's a secret between Allah and His Rasul, and another opinion is that only Allah knows He didn't even inform His Rasul. Where do we stand? That's why if you open any tafsir, it says, when you come across these words, it says, Allahu a'lamu bi muradihi bi Allah and Allah alone knows His intent by these letters. We believe in it, that this is from Allah, and we believe in the meaning that Allah wanted, and He does not want us to pry into it. Just like even um, someone much lower than Allah, or our, but our elder, our parent, or teacher, he says that, don't worry about this. Don't look into this, just leave this. It's not for you right now. So out of respect, we say, okay. My father said, don't ask about this, finish. This is what Allah Ta'ala is testing us. I told you, don't worry about this. That's it, stop. It's, not, it's beyond you right now. Khalas. So that's anyway the whole, uh, some part of the discussion of Haruful Muqatta'a, these letters. So, Subhanallah, Alif, La, Mim, we get 30 rewards. Do we know the meaning? We don't know the meaning. So there is benefit in Tilawah. And to further have benefit, of course, La'allakum ta'aqilun, so you may understand. La'allakum tatafakkarun, so you may ponder. La'allakum tatafakkarun, so you may take it. We should focus on the meanings. Allah Ta'ala made the Quran easy for us to take uh, admonition, dhikr. This tathkir, as Shah Wadiullah Dahlavi mentions in his al fuzal Kabir, is the three forms we can take benefit through tathkir. Everyone. At tathkir bi ala illa, bi ayyam illa, and bil mawti wa bi ma ba'd al maut. First is bi ala illa, through Allah's signs. So if you look through the Quran, there's so many signs he mentioned. You don't, this is, you don't need a high level fiqh for this. When Allah is talking about his signs, his blessings. So this is for everyone. This is the part that's for everyone. So we recognize that he is our mun'im, he is the one who has given all, all these blessings. And we develop that love for him. Then there's tafkir bi ayyamillah, when we, he talks about uh, different stories of Anbiya alayhim wasalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, has given us the whole Quran filled with stories for our guidance. But what's even, um, I find very fascinating, is that in the Quran, when there are Anbiya talking to their nations, they are giving examples of, of incidents that happened prior to their time. Like for example, Allah Ta'ala speaks to Musa alayhi salam, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلَى مُسَى بِآيَاتِنَا أَنَخْرِجْ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُورِ Oh Musa alayhi salam, we have sent you with our verses so you can take out your people from the darkness to the night, uh, from the darkness of uh, misguidance to the nur. وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ and remind them by telling them the stories of the nations prior to you. Shuaib alayhi salam, when he is uh, speaking to his people, he says, وَيَا قَوْمِ لَا يَجْرِ مَنَّكُمْ شِقَاقِ أَنْ يُصِيبَكُمْ مِثْلُ مَا أَصَابَ قَوْمَ نُوحٍ أو قَوْمَ هُودٍ أو قَوْمَ صَالِحٍ وَمَا قَوْمَ لُوطٍ مِنْكُمْ بِبَعِيدٍ Shuaib alayhi salam is addressing his people through the stories of the Anbiya that preceded him, Khatib al-Anbiya alayhi salam. He says that, uh, I'm afraid, if you do not listen to me, do not follow Tawheed, and you see Bakum, you will be afflicted by the same adabs that have come upon previous nations. Look what happened in Nuh. The flood. The wind. The screech of the angel that killed them. Their place of Sodom is so near you. So this is for the common people, for all of us. In the and Surah Al-Mu'min, قَالَ رَجُلُ Mu'min مِنْ آلِ فِرَاون That believer, Shamu'un from the family of Firaun, who gives that very beautiful speech in the court of Firaun, invites them towards Islam. He also tells his people, وَيَا قُومِ إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِثْلَ يَوْمِ الْأَحْذَابِ مِثْلَ دَعْبِ قُومِ نُوحٍ I am afraid that the adab of Allah will come upon you if you don't believe in Musa alayhi salam. Like the Qumi Nuh, Qumi Thamud, like the previous nations. So this is Tathkir bi Allah. And number three is tafkir bil mawti wa bima ba'd al mawt. All the discussion of death and the stages after death. That's very, very easy for us to take admonition from that. When Allah Ta'ala speaks about the day of Qiyamah, when the earthquake will come. You can imagine that. With the shams kubirat, with the nujum and kadarat, with the jibal of suyirat, the mountains will be floating. Right? With the bihar of sujirat, when the oceans will be engulfed in flames. What's going to happen? The splitting of the H2O, right? So, it's going to, and there are many different interpretations of that. So there are, all of these things are for us to think about. It's easy for everyone. That the, the Quran is revealed for us to focus on these ma'ani, these meanings. 
Allah Ta'ala says, Alam amanu an Has not the time yet come for the heart to tremble from the remembrance of Allah? Are you supposed to read that, the translation, if you can't understand it from Arabic? And say, wow, Allah is asking a question. Alam ya'ni, has not the time yet arrived? When will your hearts begin to tremble? In Surah Baqarah he says, that was hadith, he says, your hearts have become so hard, فَيَكَ hijara like rocks, or shaddu qasor, even harder than rocks. Because وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَ لَمَا يَتَشَقَّقُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ Some of the rivers, they gush forth from the rocks, on the mountain tops. And some of the يَحْبِتُ مِنَ خَشِّدِ اللَّهِ The avalanches, the mountains, from the mountains, the boulders, they fall down from the fear of Allah. The, but not a single tear is coming out. Oh I, what is wrong with you? Oh heart, why are you so hard? So this is tafkir from the translation. So this is easy. This is something we can do. So do we leave the meaning? No. Do we leave the words? No. We work on words and meanings. That's the whole discussion today about. And we have to start wherever we are at. We should not, we should not say, you know, um, I don't know how to read. I don't have to read. Yes, the warning which is there of Rubbaqari in the Qur'an, wal Qur'anu yal'anuhu. Many are those who recite the Qur'an while the Qur'an is cursing them. That is a hadith, but that is referring to the one who doesn't care about tajweed and says, I never want to learn. If you don't know tajweed and you're trying your best to read, you will get double the reward. Because the warning is there for the one who is reading without tajweed and doesn't care. But there is a virtue for the one who, who potentially may be reading without tajweed, but he's trying. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Mahiru bil Quran, the one who is an expert in reciting the Quran, Ma'al Kiram is Safarat al Barara, will be with the noble angels that are scribes. But Walladhi Yaqara al Qurana wa ita ta'ata wa fi, and the one who is reading the Quran and he stumbles, wa huwa ali shaq, and it is hard for him to read. Walla ajran, he will get double the reward. So they are both reading without tajweed. One is getting cursed, one is getting double the reward. Because one cares and is trying, one is not trying. One doesn't care. It is important. Because the Quran is Allah Ta'ala says, Waratil Qurana Tartila. Recite the Quran with Tartil. And Tartil is to have Tajweed al Huruf and Ma'rifat al Wukuf. To know how to recite the letters with the Sifat and Makharij and how to stop where to stop. Because every aspect of the Quran is preserved, even the tone and the style of its recitation. Like English, we have the Scottish accent and the Irish accent and the British accent and the Australian accent and the Canadian accent. And then you have the Eastern accent and the Western accent, Northern accent. But the Quran, there's only one accent. If somebody is reading according to Tajweed, you just hear the recitation, it could be the whitest white Bosnian, it could be the blackest black African, it could be Indonesian, it could be a Desi in the middle, brown, black, white. You can't tell. Someone speaking English, these are actual English speaking people. But if you have a Chinese person speaking English, it's going to, be very, it's going to sound very different. We always say, oh, the words are preserved, the dots are preserved, the harakat are preserved, the meanings are preserved, everything is preserved. But even the tone is preserved. Like how you recite it. Because when we study Tajweed in the beginning, what's the maqsad ghaya, what's the objective of Tajweed? To be able to recite the Qur'an kama unzira ala rasul. Exactly how it was revealed in the Prophet. Exactly how the Prophet recited it. Exactly how he taught his sahaba. That's the objective of Tajweed. Subhanallah. So, we, we have to work. As long as we are trying, we are on the right path. Allah Ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابِ We have granted this book as in legacy, as inheritance. الَّذِينَ صَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا To our, my servants who I have selected to be inheritors of the Qur'an. So each one of us was selected. But there are three categories. فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِي Some are doing the greatest zun to the Qur'an, to Allah. No, لِنَفْسِي To themselves. How? By not fulfilling the rights of the Qur'an. وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدْ Some are those going a bit, one foot ahead, then one foot back. Halfway forward, but halfway back. And number three, those who are exceeding everybody in the race, far ahead of everyone. Bi'idhnillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to try to be among the third group. Right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to uh, focus on this. I'm sorry, again, I think I went way too long. But uh, I hope that it, it provided some clarity for those who were able to remain awake through that. And uh, because among now we have to still what make amal on it. So what are we what are we going to do? What's the what's the call to action? We should make khatam of both khatam of the words by tilawa and khatam of the mani through reading the tarjuma, even if we never did before. And where we get stuck in reading the tarjuma, then we should read the tafsir of reputable scholars. There is ma'al Quran of Mufti Shafi Sahib has been translated. 
So it is the, the Quran is hidayah for all of us. So we have to read the tafasir of the ulama. And when we get stuck, فَسَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ As those who have knowledge, إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know. إِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ الْعَيَّ أَسْوَالَ The cure for ignorance is to ask. So, Allah is speaking to you, speaking to me, the whole series that we've been doing after Tarawih, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا All those who believe, Allah is addressing us. But we say, no, we're not interested. We studied 12 years high school, then 4 years, uh, 16 years undergrad, and after that master's, for the dunya, which is the darura need, was darura to taqaddaru bi qadriya, you fulfill the need as much as you need to, to get out of darar. That's what a darura comes from the word darar. So darura means you do it as much as you need to, so that you're not in darar and pain. So once you are out of darar, then you don't spend time in that, because that's not your maqsad, not your objective. But you're spending so many years for, secular, for worldly education, for earning, what about some time to understand what Allah is saying? So let us make khatam of the words and let us make khatam of the ma'ana both. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to make amal. You had a question? Oh, go ahead, inshallah, at this point. So the, I was just talking about talaw and fahm, then amal and tabliq. Um, um, the, uh, they, are, they are all four chronologically when you, you will read it first then, then you will have the opportunity to focus on the meaning uh, and after you understood it then you can make amal and then we have to do tabligh but tabligh and amal are both independent commands one is not contingent upon the other that's a, another famous misunderstanding so People think that you are not entitled to invite towards a good deed you are not doing or to prevent from a sin that you yourself are involved in. So avoiding, a good, uh, avoiding sin, ishtinaab al maasi is a separate command. And intithal bi awamirillah, doing the good deeds, commands of Allah is a separate command. And amr bil maruf, inviting towards good is a separate command. And nahi al munkar, preventing people from sin is a separate command. They are all individual commands. So one, uh, one is not contingent on the other. One is not a precondition for the other. They're separate commands. Like praying salah five times a day is a command. Fasting Ramadan is a command. So this is an example. Salah is five times a day and fasting is one month in the, in the year. But fasting is a social communal ibadah. So there are many people who don't pray but they fast. So if somebody starts fasting in Ramadan, are you going to say that, hey, since you don't pray, you can't fast? Or are you going to say, MashaAllah, you're fasting, so just like you're fasting, you should also pray. So likewise, if somebody is speaking out against evil, and saying, don't, like, don't smoke, if he says, but then you say, hey, you're smoking. He said, yeah, I'm smoking, it's bad, I'm trying to get rid of it. But just because I'm smoking, doesn't mean I can't ask you, I cannot speak out against smoking. The two different commands. Or, uh, if someone says that, you know, we should, you know, we should all pray tahajjud, well, you don't even pray fajr. So you are not qualified to invite towards khair. Inviting towards khair is a good command of Allah, and doing a khair is a command of Allah. They're two independent ones. Right? And this ayah that is misquoted, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu lima taquluna ma la tafa'loon O those who believe, why do you say that which you don't do? Kabur wa maqtan indallahi an taquluna ma la tafa'loon It is a major sin in the eyes of Allah that you say that which you don't do. This is not referring to insha'iyah, it's khabariyah. What that means is, this is referring to when people claim they did things that they didn't do. Like if you say, oh, I never miss my tahajjud for 10 years. And you, you are saying that which you don't do. That's what Allah is speaking about. Making boastful claims of things you don't do. He's not talking about inviting towards tahajjud when you don't pray yourself. You see that? that that's the opening ayah. Yeah. And then in the other ayah, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرْ Allah Ta'ala talks about the Yehudi scholars. You're inviting towards good, وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ And you forget about yourselves. So Allah Ta'ala is, وَانْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ And you read the Torah. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Do you not understand? Over here Allah Ta'ala is telling the rabbis that um, when you're inviting towards khair, that's good. But why aren't you practicing? It's like, hey, you're fasting, why don't you start praying? He's not saying stop fasting since you don't pray. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, and then the, يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَيْكُمْ وَانْفُسَكُمْ Abu Bakr Adhan, right then, from the first era, he said, watch out, لا يَغُرَنَّكُمْ Don't let this ayah deceive you. يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَيْكُمْ وَانْفُسَكُمْ Or those who believe, worry about yourself. لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ مَنْ ضَلَّ إِذَا اَحْتَدَيْتُمْ Those who go astray, they're going astray, it's not going to harm you. إِذَا اَحْتَدَيْتُمْ As long as you are on hidayah. 
So this ayah indicates that, hey, you know, just do the good deeds, don't worry about anyone else. You don't have to invite towards khair, you don't have to prevent evil. Because as long as you're rightly guided, then you're okay. You're okay as long as people are rightly guided. Uh, you're, okay, you're okay as long as you are rightly guided. Does it make a difference what other people are doing? But when are you going to be rightly guided? When you're doing good and inviting towards good. When you're abstaining from evil and you're preventing evil. When you do the whole package, then you are idah tadaytum, you are nidaya. After that, if people aren't listening, it's not going to harm you. But if you are just doing good, you're not inviting towards good, and you're abstaining from evil, you're not preventing evil, then you're not on hidayah yourself. And if you're not on hidayah yourself, then this promise of the ayah doesn't apply. You got it? Yeah, so may Allah ta'ala... So over here, amal and tabligh, you were asking, that was your question, is it a hierarchy? They are both simultaneous, parallel. May Allah ta'ala give us... Love. Any other question? Perhaps nobody wants to ask a question for this. <laughs> Tafkir, admonition, was yeah. Yeah. So basically, what what that means is that when we're reading the tafsir and the meanings of the Quran, the scholars will be explaining those ayat in their tafsir. Reputable, uh, reputable scholars will be explaining to Zahkam and then we will learn. There will be ayats about nikah and talaq and mirath and inheritance. There will be ayat about you know, all the madani ayat that have so many ahkam and injunctions and rulings. They will be explaining that. So you don't have to try to imagine it up on your own. Yeah, you can, stories, yeah. You will be able to naturally uh, um, understand that right from the translation. It, if we think about it, ponder and reflect over it, like Allah Ta'ala says, anfusikum. Look in about your own body Allah has made. Philosophy, do you not see my great? Then you sit in ponderance, like SubhanAllah, look in my eye. From the cornea all the way, you know, the retina, the optic nerve, how it's going, all this vision I see of the things, my ear, every single thing that Allah has given us, we start pondering because He told us. Now, you don't have to read the tafsir for that. You can open anatomy and physiology and start making to the bur. Right? Okay. Yes. Any other question? One, one. Uh, you said uh, you don't care about the tajweed, the Quran, the person. Yeah. Is it fine not caring? Not caring means that uh, it's not important. I could care less. I, I'm not going to make any effort. I'm not going to enroll in any online program or ask somebody here, you know, whether it's a student, make an effort to figure out how to read with tajweed um, and disregard the whole science and say it's, it's no point of that. I'll read it any way I want to. I don't have a problem. That's complete disregard. If someone's like, okay, I don't know how to recite it correctly, but I'm trying. Um, even if he's trying at whatever level, a couple hours a week, he takes a class. So that, then inshallah, this, he will, this, this uh, la'na of the Quran will not apply. Hmm. Yeah. Inshallah. There's different levels of mistakes. There's lahan jali and khafi. Major mistakes that could affect the meaning. And then there are minor levels of mistake that will, that will not, the sifat and aridah and stuff like that. Sometimes we end up adding letters in the Quran, end up making major mistakes that will affect the meaning, in fact. Those we have to watch out for. And sometimes we're adding a letter in the Quran with, and we think it looks like a minor mistake without realizing. If you say, Alhamdulillahi, hey, I just elongated the Dhamma, the Pesh, Amdu. No, you didn't. You added a wow. Lillahi, you added a ya. Oh my God, I added a letter to the Quran. Yeah, just by extending the Kasra, the Zair, you ended up adding a letter. Right? So, so, so it looks like a small mistake, but it could be a big mistake. No, we don't want to have a tajweed lesson right now, trust me. <laughs> okay, time to sleep, huh? Quran classes, yeah, there's a lot of Quran classes. Yeah. All, all adults as well, uh, different um, tajweed classes you're talking about? Yeah, there, there are different individual tajweed classes. If you want to speak to the office, alhamdulillah, so many of the senior students, they teach on the side. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, one, one English tafsir that's nice is the eight volumes, Ma'rif al-Qur'an, M-A-R-I-F, you Ma'rif al-Qur'an. Um, is it, it's in the bookstore? It's a, yeah, it's in the bookstore downstairs. I wasn't, oh yeah, I wasn't trying to um, promote the bookstore. I was going to say go to albalaq.com. Yeah, yeah, or you can go to albalaq or go downstairs, probably it's wherever you find a cheaper, better price, huh? It is present. Okay. Inshallah. Tiki, inshallah. We are Subhanallah, we are Subhanakallah, we are Hamdi, 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 we are